where it comes from. We're going to talk about internal holiness. We're going to talk about holiness as it relates to a woman's life and a man's life. Very unique and distinct journeys and calls to holiness. And so um, this is not something that's going to be happening every week. But every opportunity that I have to grace the pulpit, I'm going to champion this uh, series entitled Shine. Today, I simply want to just launch the series and I want to uh, begin to create uh, an association for you and your attitude and your heart. Uh, when I say shine, I want it to mean something to you. The key verse for this series is Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. The big idea of this series is that a life of true holiness shines. It's light in darkness. It serves as a beacon to others. It's irrefutable evidence of Jesus in our lives, and it's our role to shine. Let's pray together for this series and for the preaching of God's word. Jesus, we are here together in your presence. Lord, we are so blessed to have you in our lives, to have your word, and to even have the privilege, Lord, to be a light, to be an ambassador for you. I pray that you would just give me the grace and the words, Lord, to press ahead, Lord, and to just really begin to reimagine for all of us what holiness could really be and what it could mean for our world. In Jesus' name. concern that I have. And my concern is that apostolic Pentecostals sometimes operate with the wrong attitude regarding holiness. I think we sometimes operate with the notion that holiness is a price that we pay, or it's a cross that we bear. And I don't think that God ever intended for living a life of holiness to be a burden or to be considered a burden. I think Jesus and the epistles represent holiness as a privilege, a mark of honor of a human life. And so, isn't it true that without God, we cannot make ourselves holy? Isn't that true? We can only make ourselves unholy. I have that ability. I can make myself unholy, but I can't make myself holy. Living a holy life is out of my reach. It is unattainable. It's on another level. Have you ever just been driving by a, a new car dealership and you just kind of look longingly over there? You know, like, wow, you know, I'm driving my 21 uh, Camry. It's tough to be cool in a Camry, especially the 21, uh, 2011 version. Um, and, and you're just driving by and you're looking in that dealership and you see that. Have you seen that new Corvette? Have you seen the new Corvette? It's a mid-engine car now. The engine's not in the front. It's a mid-engine car, so it looks like a Ferrari. It looks like a Lamborghini. It's got a, it's, it's, it's and I guess it's breaking all the records and it's just unbelievable. And you drive by the dealership and you're looking at that Corvette and you're thinking, man, wouldn't that be nice? But you know, some things are just kind of out of your reach. When you really think about it, holiness is out of your reach. You can't get there. You can't be good enough. You can't be holy enough. You can't be righteous enough to be deemed as holy. It's out of your reach. But God who is rich in mercy and grace, has placed righteousness in me and grace in me, and he invites me to live a life that's beyond me, to live a level that's beyond me, to have a family culture that's beyond me, to have a family, a marriage that's beyond me, to live in freedom, to live in victory. Folks, you can't do that without God. Amen. And so, isn't it true that God's greatest attributes are his love and his holiness. Why do we embrace the idea of loving with God's love? Because the world's all about that. And we just need to love with the love of God. But we resist living with God's holiness. 
love with God's love, but live with God's holiness. Oh, no, holiness, that holiness thing. I don't know about that. We dismiss it. We don't even want to admit it's a quest that we're on. Because somebody might misunderstand that. Because the only word that holy is used in, other than a curse word, is holier than thou. And we don't want to be associated with that. And so we don't even want to admit that that's a quest or that's a reality that we just might be living in by the grace of God. Is there shame in sharing the family resemblance of holiness? Sharing that family resemblance with our Heavenly Father? Is, should we be ashamed of Christ's likeness? Well, I would suggest to you that attitude is everything. And I think we've got the wrong attitude about holiness, some of us. When you incorporate wrong attitudes and right behaviors... Right behaviors feel like wrong things. Do you remember when you had to apologize to your brother or sister after you had a fight when you were a kid? And you, when you were a kid, your mom or your dad said, you have to say you're sorry. And you're both standing there looking at each other, you know. You're just kind of glaring at them. Apologize. Boy, you would say it, wouldn't you? You'd say sorry, wouldn't you? Come on, let me hear you. How would you say it? That's right. Sorry. We would say it as sarcastically as we possibly could. It was a right behavior with the wrong attitude. And that bad attitude took the joy out of reconciliation between you and your sibling. It took the joy out of it for your sibling. It took the joy out of your parents' trying to reconcile the two of you. And so it was, the, it was the wrong attitude about a right behavior. And so you probably got a right behavior to your backside for your wrong attitude after you said it like that. Right? Is it possible that we have the wrong attitude about the right behavior of holiness? Is it possible that maybe there's even a little bit of a shred of shame, that it's a mark on our life, that that uh, we, we, we don't want, any, want anybody to mention it or reference it. And, and the Lord says, I want, you, I want you to shine. I want you to shine so people can see you. And in seeing you and in seeing that light in you, it's going to bring glory to me. Shine. Is it possible that our wrong attitude dims the light that is supposed to shine in our world? Is it possible that we've traded shine for whine? And when we talk about the things that relate to holiness in our lives, we talk about it disparagingly, negatively. Have we lost our joy in representing Jesus to the world? My goal in this series is to restore the shine and holiness and to help you to practically understand how you can celebrate this in your life. Because holiness is not supposed to be drudgery, and holiness is not supposed to be something you just do out of duty. This should be something that we delight in. Yeah, we get a kick out of it, like, privileged, honored. What does shine mean? The word shine in Matthew chapter 5 or 16 simply means, in the Greek, to give light. To give light. Another word for give is to share. To share. So apostolic Pentecostals need to practice generosity. Yes, we need to practice generosity by sharing the glorious light of Jesus through our holiness, through our life. Give the light, share the light. 
Don't hoard it. You know, it's bright in here. It's bright in here. It's a midweek service, and and we have two worship songs after the announcements, and we got a mosh pit up here at ATC on a Wednesday. It's a midweek, and we got people coming up, and they're getting their praise on, and we're excited, and we're glad, and, and, and we support the worship, and we support the preaching of the Word, and it's bright in here, but this light needs to go out there. This light needs to go to the whole world. Amen. The world needs this light. We need to share this light, not hoard it, and just come together with all the candelabras and all shine on one another, but literally to go into the into the darkness of your workplace, the darkness of your school, the darkness of your campus, and, and truly and intentionally, through generosity, be the light of Jesus to our world. To reject a life of holiness is to reject sharing. If the price is too high, and I don't want to do this holiness thing, it is a rejection of the sharing of the light of Jesus Christ. Now, for the sake of the series, I'd like to add a few more ideas to the call to shine. Note takers, would you write this down? Shine means to be confident about who you are and who you belong to. Being confident about who you are and being confident about who you belong to. Shine means that we wear the jersey, the Jesus jersey with pride, with holy patriotism. We're not ashamed of our Jesus jersey. Yep, I put on Christ in baptism. That's me. I'm spirit filled. That's me. I love Jesus. That's me. I live a little bit differently. I might dress a little bit differently. That's me. I've got the Jesus jersey on. I'm proud of it. All right. I actually received a Jesus jersey for Christmas. Yep. Was that Jada? Analia? Got me a Jesus jersey. It was extra large. I'm a 2X, so I have work to do. I'm going to get into that. I have a goal to wear the Jesus jersey, to practice what I preach. And I'm going to wear the Jesus jersey. We're in that thing with pride. Being proud about, about the fact, uh, yes, I'm apostolic Pentecostal. I am one of them. Amen. You know, we've got these uh, invite cards that are out in the foyer. And it says, I love my church. I think you would too. And it's got the information on the back. It's just like, you just, uh, I know, I know you've got thoughts and ideas, but just come one time. Just come and experience this thing. I promise you, you won't fall asleep. Money back guarantee. If you don't like it, you get your dollar back. I mean, it's how can you lose? How can you lose? Shine. Shine means to freely emanate the light of Jesus that he so graciously put in you. Freely. Not begrudgingly. Freely. Never met a Packer fan who was embarrassed to wear a Brett Favre jersey. They might be a little embarrassed to wear an Aaron Rodgers jersey, but that's another story. It's graduation. I had the privilege to speak at my daughter's college graduation commencement. And that was a huge honor. Huge honor. All of these, all of these college graduates. Now, they, they're just young adults. I have not one time ever seen uh, a young adult wearing a square hat for no reason. In fact, I would think that they would avoid that because those hats, those graduation hats look dumb. 
don't know who came up with it. I don't know. Let's go find out why. Okay? Because there's got to be a better way to celebrate graduation than to wear a square hat. They're wearing a square hat and a baptistry robe. All of them, even in high school. They'll all wear a square hat. They'll all wear a baptistry robe. They're proud of the fact that they graduated, some of them just by the skin of their teeth. And so it, all the way from the class clown to the 4.0 student, they all put on a square hat and a baptistry robe. Think about it. Is it possible that the enemy has somehow polluted our thinking to the point where we wouldn't dress holy. That for whatever reason, it's just, I'm just too embarrassed. I just can't do that. I just can't go there. I just can't be like that. I can't be holy. I, 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 I can't walk away from the dirty joke in the workplace. I don't even want to swear, but sometimes I just throw it in because I don't want anybody to think I'm a weirdo. I don't want anybody to discover who and what I really am. It's possible that the enemy has polluted our thinking toward holiness. Is it possible that the enemy has conned us into ascribing to this I have to narrative about holiness instead of I get to? It's my high calling. It's my reasonable service. Galatians 5.17, Paul declared that he was branded on his body for Jesus. It's time for the church to shine. It's time for the church to proudly bear the marks. I'm going to tell you something. It's not time for the apostolics to blend in. Other churches can do that. Other churches can try that. But there's something refreshing about people who will come into the house of God lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. There's something powerful. There is something different about a church that truly celebrates holiness. It's different. And I get these reports all the time. People who come from churches that might even sing some of the songs that we sing, but they don't sing the songs the way they, that we sing them. And they don't feel what they feel in that other church. They don't feel what they feel when they're coming here. There's something powerful. There's something pronounced. There's something that distinguishes this church. And I'm going to tell you, it's born from the fact that we are a church that celebrates holiness and purity. We've got to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. It's our time to shine. This world is getting darker. Amen. Look at Matthew 5, 16 again. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus said, shine before who? Before men. Shine before men. Your holiness does have something to do with other people. We can, see, I'm talking about shining. And we got this wrong attitude. Well, I just, it's just me and God. And I don't know how I feel about this, how I feel about that. I, I don't know if I have this conviction about holiness. Hold on just for a second. Holiness isn't just about you. Holiness is about people seeing a counterpart to the sinful world that we're living in. Yes, where women look like women. And men look like men. And we have a heart of holiness. We have a spirit of holiness. We have a mind of holiness. Yes, we will live in contrast to the world. Why do we let our light shine? It's, yes, we're giving glory to, God, but to, to glory to God, but we are also shining for others. To be a beacon for others. Our life is God's chandelier in this world so others can see the beauty of Jesus Christ. Don't worry. I'm going to start at the beginning when we get into holiness. I'm going to let us know that holiness starts on the inside. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about the fact that outward holiness is nasty when there's no inward holiness. And we don't want to be that church. 
We don't want to be the church that just looks at the hymn line, but we don't think about the heart. We don't want to be that kind of a church. But if we ever get the hymn line and the heart lined up, now you've got an apostolic powerhouse. When we get the heart right and it shines to the world and our lifestyle, our behavior, and how we dress, it's powerful, it's persuasive, it's transformation. Amen. Shine. Shine in this world by living a transformed life. A transformed life. We have to be careful that we're, our number one goal isn't to be like the world and to blend in with the world. Something is wrong if we're not different. I don't care what generation of God followers you look at in the Bible and in history, they were always different. They were always different in culture and society. Apostolics, our call is a countercultural call. We're not countercultural just to be different. We're countercultural because our culture is a kingdom culture. And the kingdom culture is revealed to us in the Word of God. So don't get mad at the preacher when the preacher preaches the Word of God, the whole counsel regarding our heart, our attitude, our thought life. When your pastor draws a fence line in this sinful world and talks about how we should live, don't get mad at the preacher. The preacher's espousing a kingdom culture. We're not going to change the world if we're trying to be like the world. Somebody said amen. All right, I'm supposed to be teaching. I'm preaching a little bit, being a little preachy. In order to champion our call to shine in darkness, I want to unpack the, the, the theology of light and darkness in Scripture. Because this call to shine, it is a powerful thing. You need to understand what this call to shine is really all about. It's about emanating light. It's about emanating light. When we study the scripture, we need to consider the law of first mention. I talk about this a lot. The law of first mention says that the first time a principle or topic is addressed, pay attention because it is foundational to every other mention of that principle or topic to the rest of the Bible. So let's consider the law of first mention as it relates to light in darkness. Law of first mention, foundational truth about darkness. First of all, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So here's the law of first mention regarding darkness. Darkness rules where there is no creative power. God has not spoken creatively into that situation, so darkness rules. Darkness rules where there is no creative power. Darkness only rules in the absence of light. It's the only way that darkness can rule. If there is no light in your life, Darkness rules. If your light's not shining in your workplace, darkness rules. All right? Law first mentioned. Darkness rules where there's no creative power. Darkness rules only in the absence of light. If there's no light, darkness rules. Law first mentioned foundational truth about light. And the Spirit of God, continuing to read, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. No takers, light only exists by power. That's the only way that light, you can't have light without fuel, without some source of power. Light was born, how? By the creative voice of God. Light was born by the creative voice of God. So how many of you know that the light that is in you is only by the power of God? That's the only way I can be the light. I want to ask you a question. Do you have the power? 
Do you have the power? If you're not a light in your world, you've got a power problem. Amen. You've got a power problem or you've got a power connection problem in your life. So, a foundational truth about the relationship of light and darkness. Again, the law first mentioned, what is the relationship between light and darkness? Verse 4, and God saw the light and it was what? Good. So, we know the good team. It's, it's the team with light. God saw the light that it was good and God did what? God divided the light from the darkness. So, light and darkness are eternally irreconcilable. Because God said it's that way. Did you know there's not going to be darkness when we get to heaven? There will be no need for a sun because it's the city where the Lamb is the light. The glory of God will eternally radiate over us in that holy city. Paul asks, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So this is speaking to the relationship between light and darkness. And to answer this question, none. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? The answer is none, because God divided the light from the darkness in the beginning. And when you give your life to Jesus and you submit to his power source, he immediately begins to set to work dividing the light and the darkness in you. From the very beginning, God separates light and darkness. What is God going to do with his church? He's going to separate us. We are not going to be a copy of culture. That's not going to happen. There's going to be a dividing, a separating. God's going to take the darkness out of us. And the light is going to shine exclusively in us if God has his way. Amen. Now we need to know this. That light is greater than darkness. Because light requires power. Right? Darkness is the absence of power. When Were you guys in that storm, that windstorm the other night? And did the power go out for a second at your place? The power went out for a second in our place. And we were sound asleep. And all of a sudden, we're sitting up in bed and we're trying to figure out what just happened. All the power went out. And it's just pitch black in our house. So, darkness rules only in the absence of power. It only rules in the absence of light. Light rules whenever it is activated. Think about that. No takers, write that down. That's a revelation about who you are. This is the story of God's church. Light rules when it's activated. Light and darkness are separate, irreconcilable to each other. But light is greater than darkness. Now, the Bible uses light and darkness as a spiritual metaphor. Okay? Now, when we talk about darkness, we understand darkness doesn't have a lot of utility for the average person. Right? Unless you're sleeping. Then it's helpful. But really, it doesn't have a lot of utility for the average person. Have you ever tried to walk in the dark? Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? I remember when we were remodeling our house and my parents' bedroom was in the basement and the railing was off of the, the stairs and my dad walked right off the stairs in the dark. Remember that, Dad? You walked right off the stairs and you landed on your back right on the table. Boom! That's what darkness would do for you. It just doesn't... <laughs> there's just no redeeming value in it. And if you think walking in the dark is hard, try living in it. Darkness is only useful if you're using an old school camera and you want to develop negatives. Spiritually, darkness is only useful for, for, for developing the negatives in your life. 
Proverbs 4.19 tells us the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. When you're living in spiritual darkness apart from God, and you were in an abusive situation in your childhood, and you were like, That's, I'm never going to be that, I'm never going to do that to my kids, people who are living in darkness oftentimes find themselves bumping into the same things their parents bumped into, and they don't know why. They don't understand why they're continuing the cycle of addiction. They don't understand what it is that they're bumping into that's placing a lid on their life and preventing them from having a sense of purpose or meaning. Darkness is associated with demonic power in the Scripture or the state of a person's life apart from God. And this is why the Bible describes hell as a dark place, Matthew 8, 12. But if the sons of the kingdom will be cast into the lake, into outer darkness. The sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Everybody say outer darkness. Since Adam and Eve's mismanaged moment in the Garden of Eden, their sin, all people, are born into a fallen state. They are in a place of separation from God. And until a person is born again of the water and of the Spirit, he or she is living in spiritual darkness. Sin keeps the light off. Sin impairs your sight. Sin blackens your mind. The Apostle Paul describes people who live apart from God as having darkened minds and being blinded. Ephesians 4.18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness in their heart. One of Job's friends reflected that people who are living in spiritual darkness, this is what he said. He said, they meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. Man, that will preach. That is a preaching scripture. Woo. That is the definition of a sinner's life. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime as in the light. They're lost. Their minds are clouded. They are blind. Like that song says, I was blind, but now I see. We know that there are people in this world who love spiritual darkness. John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Yes, we live in a world where some people love darkness. You need to be careful because your eyes will adjust to the dark. Yes, your eyes will adjust to the dark. We don't want to acclimate to that darkness. And there are some people, they have acclimated it to the point that they love it. John's Gospel says, because their deeds were evil. People love darkness. Darkness obscures what you're doing. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it seems like most bars are dark. Never buy furniture in a dimly lit, lit furniture store. Why? I'm trying to get away with something. People love spiritual darkness because their deeds are evil. So there is a spiritual darkness. It's a life void of the power of God. So they just become an echo. Like everybody else. But this light, this is also a metaphor of Scripture. First John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And this is this would tell us that light is more than a metaphor, it is a reality, and that God is light, the Bible says. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not have the truth. 
and into this inky blackness of sinful humanity came the light of Jesus Christ. First John 4 and 5, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Listen to Jesus' words, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Through Jesus, we are delivered from that blinding darkness. Through Jesus, we receive light. We receive illumination. Is there anybody who's come to Jesus? And you can say, all of a sudden, I'm realizing that's what I was bumping into. That was the trap I was always stepping into. But now the wisdom and the light of Jesus says, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't say that. And all of a sudden, you have this quickening spirit, this enlightenment, this wisdom from above that helps you to live on another level. You've got a light now through the power of the Holy Ghost. Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Ephesians 5 and 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are you the light in the world. And here's the call. Walk as children of the light. You know what this verse is saying? It's saying that you can... It say, he says, but now ye are the light in the world. You are the light. But he says, walk as children of the light. In other words, you can have the light, but not walk like you've got the light. And live like you have the light. So when we receive the power of God's Spirit, we receive the power to shine God's light. Let's read Jesus' full statement in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. In this is our uh, core text for the series. Jesus says, ye are the light of the world. Ye, you're the light of the world, people. You better figure out who you are. You better figure out what your job is. It's to shine. He says, ye are the light of the world. This city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus said, let your light shine. Let means give permission to Allow, permit. Apostolics aren't supposed to have lampshades. We're just supposed to let the light shine. You've got to let it, though. You can have it, but not let it. You can have the light, but not permit it. Not allow it. Let your light shine. Church, your fingers on the light switch. You, your finger is on the light switch in your world. Praise God. There's no such thing as a dark switch. Do you have a dark switch in your home? Time to go to bed. I'm going to turn on the dark. There's no such thing as a dark switch. You don't turn darkness on. You turn light off for a room to be dark. If it's dark in our world, whose fault is that? If it's dark in your world, if it's dark in my world, it's because the light switch is off. I remind you, darkness will rule in Appleton in the absence of light. Light can't rule in Appleton 
Excuse me, if it's not activated, that's what I meant to say. Light can't rule in a heart that's hard if it's not activated. I'm calling Apostolic Truth Church to shine. I'm calling you to rediscover what it means to live a holy, countercultural life. It's not a drag. It's not a cross that you bear. It's not a burden. It is a privilege. And we need to restore the holy patriotism of being children of the light. We've got it, and we need to walk like we've got it. And we need to live like we got it. It's time to shine. As the musicians come, I want to ask you a few questions. What kind of light are you? Are you a Christmas light used occasionally, but more for show than anything else? Kind of in and out of the box, in and out of the basement, sometimes on display, sometimes not. Are you a flashing light? On, off, on, off. No consistency. Are you a candlelight? Easily blown out. Are you a reflective light? You know, Jesus is our source.
we can shine. Somebody said, I can shine. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we are going to shine. We are going to shine, Lord. We refuse to let the enemy Thank you.